Welcome to another video explaining the universe using the particle model. Well, today's video uh, is on the photoelectric effect. Uh, this is part one. Uh, it's going to be a second part to this uh, later to explain more. I have made uh, two previous videos on diodes, the light, the, the diode itself and then the light emitting diode, and I intend to go on to the photo uh, diode and the laser diode, but to help explain the photo diode better, I felt it was good to cover the photoelectric effect. So if you haven't watched these two videos on the diodes, that would be helpful. Okay, this part one, I'm going to talk about what is the photoelectric effect, in particular about some of the history, the beginning of this, uh, how the, the wave particle duality paradox came about, and uh, Einstein winning the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. And then an experiment, uh, there, uh, I'm going to explain an experiment that I found on the internet that helps us understand what's going on. Okay, so for those of you who don't know what the uh, photoelectric effect, this is the definition of it from Wikipedia. The photoelectric effect is the emission of electrons, primarily electrons, but other free carriers when light, typically visible light or high frequency uh, electromagnetic waves hits a material. Electrons are emitted in this manner, can be called photoelectrons. And they mix it up all the time. I've heard, uh, you'll see they call it pho photons, they call it electrons and photoelectrons. It gets a little bit confusing. Well, here's the, gives a general idea of what the photoelectric effect is all about. What we have here is a um, piece of material in particular made of potassium and is being hit by different frequencies of light. There's red light, green light, violet light. The red light has a wavelength of 700 nanometers, green 550 and violet uh, 400 nanometers. And as they hit, they emit electrons. These are the electrons being emitted or not. Turns out that red with the uh, uh, energy of 1.77, that energy is calculated using this equation, which we'll actually get into in the next video. But if you use this equation, and this is Planck's constant times uh, nu, which is the frequency, Planck's constant times frequency, or Planck's constant times the speed of c over wavelength, if you use this formula, it's the same as this one, you get 1.77 electron volts is the amount of energy carried by each photon when it's representing red. Well, potassium requires 2.2 e, uh, two electron volts. And as a consequence, red <coughs> never will emit an electron from potassium. But green does, because green has, an, uh, has a uh, photon energy of 2.25 electron volts, and uh, uh, violet has 3.1, both of them greater than 2, both of them emitting electrons. Now, this conservation of energy uh, amounts to the fact that if what they're saying is the energy in, point with this electron volts in, must match the energy out if it's going to be equal. They're ignoring heat and any other issues, assuming that's minimal. Energy in equals energy out. Well, the energy out of an electron, if it has a mass and moving at a velocity, its energy is one half mv squared. And so you can calculate the energy for the green by using this formula, you equate it to this. If, if you know the mass of the electron, you can calculate the velocity, and they show you the velocity. So this is 
based on the conservation of energy and of course a lot of work done uh, testing and, and measuring things. Okay, a little bit of the history. They all started back in 1839 with Alexander Edmund Becquerel, who discovered the photovoltaic effect while studying the effect of light on an electrolytic cells. Apparently, shone light on the cell and, and observed in some way the fact that electrons were emitted. About 50 years later, Heinrich Hertz observed the photoelectric effect and the production and reception of the electromagnetic waves. This, this implies photons in and photons out, electromagnetic wave in and electromagnetic wave out, but he gets a lot of credit, uh, often it's called the Hertz effect. So that was in 1887. Well, later in 1902, a, a gentleman named Leonard observed that the energy of the individual emitted electrons, how much energy that 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 one half mv squared, uh, how much it, it increased with the frequency, <clears throat> and of course frequency is related to color, and of the light, and eventually this equation was developed, and 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 so when when that seemed to be in contrast to what Maxwell, Maxwell is very is famous for his wave theory of light. And he predicted that the electron energy in this case would be proportional to intensity. So is it frequency or is it intensity? And that's part of what we're going to be looking into. Uh, this is the energy based on frequency and this is the intensity measured in watts per square meter. <clears throat> well, Einstein in 1905 published four papers, and one of them was titled The Photoelectric Effect, and he has solved this paradox between intensity and frequency by describing light as composed of discrete quanta, a chunk of energy, one, which we now call photons, rather than continuous waves. Based on a Planck's theory of black body radiation, Einstein theorized that the energy in each quantum of a light was equal to the frequency multiplied by a constant. And that constant was later called Planck's constant. Uh, here's, the, here's the big uh, change in physics. This discovery led to quant the quantum revolution in physics. And yeah, I know quantum mechanics, quantum theory, uh, whatever, uh, they're, they're uh, very confusing and, and very, uh, well, very confusing. But this paper earned Einstein the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1929, 1921, excuse me. He never got a Nobel Prize for his theory of relativity, either special or general. But it brings about the concept of wave-particle duality. Uh, my, Maxwell's theory of waves was very strong. This idea of a quanta of uh, energy hitting the atom and releasing uh, an electron uh, made it look more like a particle. So end up with wave-particle duality. It's, uh, it, it started right there. And of course, the uh, the double slit experiment just emphasized the point. The particle bound, of course, suggests that light is a stream of particles with a repeating pattern. And if true, there is no wave particle duality with this model, because there's only particles. The wave comes about by a distribution of particles in a repeating pattern. Okay, so the measurements really help understand how all this came about and, and, and what were they really measuring. So I found this video. I recommend you watch it. It's, it's very instructive. And he covers three different points. The effect of light intensity on when you do the shine it on a material. And this is part one that I'm talking about today. And the energy, but the next two or I will pick up in part two. Okay, so this is the set, a setup that the uh, 
the video I just referenced uh, uses. It has a lamp controlled by using intensity. This is shown at low intensity. You can move it up to high intensity. It shows it at high frequency. Uh, this is the ultraviolet frequency, which is a short wavelength, high frequency, and then this is the red and infrared, which is uh, uh, low frequency and, and a very wide uh, uh, man, uh, wavelength. And so uh, this is the uh, this is two plates inside a, a glass container where you shine the light on it and the electrons get emitted and circulate around through the uh, through the meter and the battery. And uh, and, and so what uh, he, the uh, video goes through uh, uh, demonstrations of how this works. And this is the setup. Okay, so this is one point in the demonstration where you have a high intensity, 91% in, intense, a uh, very strong light. You have a high frequency. Turns out that at high frequencies, you always get electrons emitted. At lower frequencies, not so much. There's, there's, there's a, a stopping point. But in this case, we have the intensity real high. This dot shows, uh, you know, the video slides the, uh, this intensity back and forth, and you, you go up and down through this curve to the point where you have no electrons being emitted, and that's indicated by the fact that the current is zero when you have low, low or no intensity, and when the intensity is very high, you have a high current. And so the current meter tells us how, whether it's flowing or not flowing, and generally how much. The theory stated here is, although this battery is set at zero volts at this time, it, basically, why do the electrons go this way? Well, if this is positive, it has a positive plate, and the electrons are negative, they get attracted. But I question that when this battery is zero, or even not there, when it's not there. Why should it go this way? Um, but uh, so this is the, you can vary the intensity up and down, and you vary up and down that curve. So let's talk about now the physics of what happens when the photon hits the material. The same Wikipedia uh, that I gave you for the definition of the photoelectric effect that, com that, that comes from that same uh, source, the, it's, it's an interaction between the incident photon and the innermost electrons. It says it, the photon has to hit the innermost electron. The movement of the of an outer electron, that's a different electron, to occupy the vacancy then results in the emission of a photon. Of course, the other thing said, well, sometimes they're called, they can be called a photoelectron. Here the, it's emitting a photon or the photoelectron, and yet we're also saying it's electron. It's a very confusing. They use these terms interchangeably, but it's confusing about what they're talking about. Uh, now, now the uh, I interpret it as an electron. Uh, the only way you can develop current through that current meter is to have the uh, electron flowing through it. So it's emitted in the electron, not a photon, not a photoelectron, but an electron. My interpretation. Well, this whole idea that there, that you hit an innermost electron and it, it uh, leaves a hole by jumping up and then it falls back down and creates, uh, I, I in, in my video called The Candle Part One, I talked about this and this, this uh, graph is from this link. In this case, it's a particle hitting the innermost electron it jumps up to a level, then falls back down and releases energy in the form of a photon. You see the similarity between the previous description and this one, except this is about a particle generating a photon. 
and the photoelectric takes a photon hitting the innermost one, that goes somewhere, and then an electron in the uh, outer shell falls into the open space left by that one, creating a an electron. The energy would create like a very confusing. So I found one that fits more what I think really is happening. This is from another link. It shows a photon. There's the wavelength and there's the um, packet of energy that hits this and knocks it out. Simple particle hits particle and knocks it out. Uh, that's a, a much simpler explanation rather than hitting this and jumping it up and down on energy levels. Admittedly, and I haven't, this, this is clear in any of these descriptions, that the uh, energy level is quantized and that quantizing comes from the fact that they claim it jumps from this energy level to that and these are quantized steps that are jumping and so uh, that gives some of the credibility to the uh, to that explanation. But in the particle model, all we have is a stream of G1s coming in here. This could represent a peak. That peak hits this one maybe multiple times and knocks it out of orbit. A simple mechanical interaction. Uh, this is the particle model description of that that self-same uh, video that I showed earlier, where you have a stream of light, high intensity, high frequency light hitting this plate, uh, emitting electrons and the electrons going around through here. Uh, there's a current meter here or ammeter. <coughs> uh, amb <coughs> Uh, it inserts a shunt resistor of a very low value, like one milliohm in series here. You might as well just consider this not here. It has zero volts. And the electrons flow around and around like this. And, and the question would be, uh, uh, okay, if you got these peaks hitting the uh, electron, whether it's an inner electron or an outer electron, the peaks have enough energy. If they happen to collide, they knock them out and the electrons are, will scatter in all directions. But in the particle model, we have G2 gravity. There's a, a G2 force. And what's happening here is as this light causes electrons to be emitted, you're losing G1s. So this G1, G2 gravity is caused by, a G2 mass is caused by the number of G1s in this object. As it loses them, it gets less and less. It has a smaller G2 mass. This might gain. <coughs> it, they could be trapped as they go by and be an orbital here, or most of them pass through and just go around. Even if they don't gain, when this one loses, there's an imbalance between the two. This is like a lighter mass, and this is like a heavier mass. This is more G1s, a heavier mass, lighter mass, that's G2 mass. As a consequence, there's a, there's a net force pushing this way, gravitational force moving this way. There's a smaller one moving that way. It's just like the Earth here and the Moon. Both of them are being pushed, but the Moon gets pushed harder than the Earth. So there's more acceleration this way. So it's G2 gravity that actually moves the electrons in that direction. And you can apply uh, my standard. Uh, I usually start with a number of G1s here entering the battery. Since it's a zero volts, it doesn't add any G1s. While this does add G1, so this kind of looks like a battery in itself. We only the G1s are generated in a photoelectric way. In the battery, it's generated chemically. But there's none here, so this is A appears here. You have a gain here. That gain has to be lost there. And it's, if you leave this in a static, stable condition, we'll establish a number of G1 particles flowing around. There'll be a base value of number of A flowing around, this adding, and it looks like a battery adding and a, with a load resistor. That's the particle model explanation. G2 force, G2 gravity is the primary reason these electrons 
or or I should say G1 particles move towards the this plate. Okay, so here's uh, a high intensity, high frequency uh, picture showing uh, the electrons moving this way. The intensity is way up. The frequency is it's the ultraviolet frequency, and it's a high frequency, very short wavelength. So you've got a lot of electrons. So the intensity, the point here is this is high intensity, high current. The current is also almost one amp flowing through here and around. If you slide this down, you change the intensity, you're sliding down this slope until you get to zero intensity. Of course, with zero light, you get zero emission. And, and so it shows that the number the number of electrons flowing through the ammeter, what tells you that the higher the intensity, the higher the current, that must mean there's more electrons emitted. So the simple statement is high intensity with a high frequency gives you a, a higher flow of current. Well, in intensity, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, what are they changing when they change intensity in, in, in that circuit? And I looked this up in Wikipedia. Intensity can be found by taking the energy density, that's the energy per volume, at a point in space and multiplying by the velocity at which the energy is moving. The resulting vector has units of power divided by area and intensity is expressed in watts per meter. And yes, that all works, but we're talking about energy density, velocity, multiplying together, getting a vector. It doesn't, you know, what are they doing? I mean, that's a lot of good words. You can look up energy density, you can look up velocity, you can look up vector, try to understand. It's not so easy. Uh, and this is the result of that one's experiment we just did with a given frequency. That's the frequency was set at a high frequency. With a given frequency, an increase of intensity, that is an increase of more photon, increases the number of electrons. And that was the conclusion from the... But I added this here. Uh, the video, this video didn't say that. I found this in another video where it clearly explained that a more intensity meant more photons. Photon, red photon has the same energy all the time. It's according to that equation, energy equals Planck's constant times frequency, red always has that same energy. So when you get an increased intensity, it's because you have more photons. Well, what about the intensity of the G1 stream? In the particle model explanation, I got a stream of G1 particles where the peaks have a cluster of, of G1s moving together. And I could describe, this is my explanation, of that stream in terms of what its energy might be related to. What about amplitude? More G1s per peak. The more G1s you have, the more likelihood that that clump of one of those G1s in that peak are going to hit and knock that electron out of its orbit. What about frequency? The higher the frequency, the more peaks per unit time. The lower the frequency, you don't get as many peaks per time. So the percent hit, amount hit, it's going to be less. High frequency is going to give you a much better chance. Low frequency, if it's low enough, you don't get anything. What about the number of streams emitted by the source? That's the same as the number of photons emitted by the light. All of these things, to me, could be related. And, and I've never, I've not generated an equation for uh, this. Like, they have energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency. I don't have an equation. I do have a force equation for G1 gravity based on a G1 particle field. It's a whole different scenario involving the same particle. The force equation for light based on a stream of G1 particles with a repetitive pattern hitting the atom and knocking out. I have not drawn that out and tried to develop it. Someday, maybe I'll get to do that. Okay, this is the uh, a final review. So what we learned with the one test is 
that you have to have a certain amount of energy or you can't em emit the photon. The, the light, the photon hits it. Uh, if you believe their model, it, it hits the innermost electron. It, it, it does something, it goes somewhere, who knows. Another electron falls down, releasing the energy, and it releases. One time they say photon, one time they say photoelectron. No, it releases a, a, an electron. Green and violet will always release because uh, the energy of those photons are greater than, than this. Um, particle model, green will release it because it, it, its uh, wavelength is uh, shorter. It's, uh, it, it, the intensity could be higher by having more of them, more, more G1 particles in the peak. And so you, you get the same effect. Next time, my next video is going to be talking about this velocity and, and how it's, uh, it's calculated in my comments about that. My name is Bobby Hilster, and I am your Particle Model Guru. Tune in next time when I'll explain more of the universe using the Particle Model. Thank you for your attention.